Today uh, is Super Bowl Sunday, and yeah, we, we definitely have a kind of a sports theme message, but don't get me wrong, it's, 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 it's just a tool. Uh, every, everything that we're talking about, every message is, it's all about Jesus. Amen? Amen? But before I talk, I actually wanted to share a little bit about what happened last week at the end of the service. Uh, I kind of almost lost it for a minute, and I kind of wanted to explain, because a couple of people asked me what happened. Um, for those of you that have been in a similar situation where, like, everything you own is suddenly gone, it's a weird feeling. And you go through your day and you suddenly, you know, you remember something that you don't have anymore. So what happened at the end of the service last week was um, Tommy, you know, gave a great message from God and we, um, Pastor Tommy, and um, at the end of the service, hey, don't forget, it's Super Bowl Sunday next week. You know, every year we wear our jerseys, we have a sports theme, kind of a message. And I, in like these nanoseconds in my brain, <clears throat> I thought, well, I've got tons of jerseys. And I, then I thought like in this nanosecond, well, my dad's no longer here. You know, maybe it's a tribute. I'll wear the jersey that my dad always wore. And in a split second, I had told everybody, hey, I'll wear my jerseys. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. I don't, I don't have a jersey right now. But it wasn't just that. It was also the fact that my dad's jersey that I, I thought about wearing wasn't there. And, and I almost kind of lost it, but um, it's okay. It was, it was really cool through the week because a lot of people had called me up about that and were comforting and, and very, you know, very kind. Um, and this was a gift from someone in the church and the family, and I thank you for it. And I got, even I didn't, I've never owned one, but I had a LeBron James jersey because he's now with the Lakers, and Lakers are my team, so um, I want to thank you for that. Um, but it was kind of weird. <clears throat> Because that's going to lead me up to this message today. And I think God planned it that way. Just, why did I react that way? Because I, frankly, I don't, I don't care about shirts and things. And, and in the big picture, I don't care about, you know, things and sports and, in the big picture. But what happened was, it wasn't what these, as a fan, happened to me. It was more about the moments in my life where God had blessed me. As a, as a son, to have a dad that um, the way we bonded was through sports. Because in sports, there's this drama, the excitement, passion, this competition, there's this intensity. And for somebody that loved sports growing up, besides music, there was just times where at the important point in my life, um, you know, being a, a fan of a, of a sport like basketball, you know, brought me closer uh, to my uh, to my family, it was a um, it was a tool that God used to to use um, to make Himself present to me, like music. I didn't get back into church for a long time until my wife comes home and says, "This church has a really good band. You got to hear this band." And it was this tool that God used to get me in. So before I share a message, I want to make sure you know the message is not sports and how great it is. It's Jesus, how amazing He is, and how He uses things to get our attention. Amen? So let me read 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? But only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with every purpose, with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete. Train it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might, I might myself be disqualified. So I was thinking about this again, because I gave a message similar to this about four years ago, when we had just opened. But with all the things going on right now, there's a lot of uh, relevancy to this message. And the men of Bible study Thursday night, we have this Bible study any man is, in, is invited. We've been holding them at the new building. Um, just circle up chairs and sit in the foyer. We were talking about how challenging this world is right now. Just, there's a lot of things going on. Great things, don't get me wrong. But we've been, we've been studying the book of James, and it's about having joy and finding joy despite the trials and tribulations that go on. It tests our faith and our endurance, like, like a race, like, like this event the event of all events, life. So we start talking about training ourselves and figuring out how we build ourselves up spiritually. 
and in a sense build ourselves up in the ways of God so that we're strong and, and we realize that, that this life, this test, is this great, also this competition. This competition about who are we going to let lead our lives? Who are, who, who, whose team are we on? See, the, some of the best moments I've ever had in my life had to do with music, but also sports. See, I remember, um, obviously, for those of you that have heard me talk about this before, my, my kids are both you know, pretty good athletes, and, and my daughter, Allison, played basketball, but ever since we were uh, you know, younger and my kids were young, we, we played out in our, in our yard. We had this big yard, we had a basketball court, and we played baseball and football, we threw frisbees, and at the time we had this really cool dog named Bear, I'd throw the frisbee, he'd catch it, and it was really cool. And Mary played some basketball, but she was this great cheerleader, and she was a flyer, they'd throw up in the air, and, and Allison played basketball since, I, I literally had, oh, thank God I still have this video, almost it had. I have this video of Allison, one year and 11 months dribbling a basketball. Pretty good, too. And uh, the connection with my dad was that uh, my parents were divorced. I didn't see my dad a lot when I was a kid. And um, the way that we, he wanted to bond with me was to, um, he took me to a Laker game when I was 11. That's the first time I really remember bonding with my dad. That's why um, it means a lot to me. But, you know, watching my kids grow up and, and seeing the sports, I, I remembered that, you know, I was being blessed as we were going through life and seeing these things unfold all around us. See, the thing about sports that I really started to realize as a metaphor and what Paul was talking about, the athletes are so well trained. They just train their bodies. It's like they get up in the morning, they eat the right things, they try to drink the right things, they, they exercise, they, they, they stay away from the things that would be harmful to their body. They're so dedicated, the hard work, the study, the training, the sacrifice, the discipline, the passion for being in shape physically. And I started to think, that's a pretty big challenge for us Christians, to train ourselves spiritually in that manner. See, we need to look at ourselves now, especially more than ever, as these spiritual athletes. Disciplined, trained, passionate, working on our skills. The, the drive and the dedication is to keep the best that we can in our relationship with Jesus. And for those of you that have had some type of training or, or, or athletics in your life, and you start to think about it, and I thought about it. I, I played basketball in high school, and I never got to the college level like my daughter did, but, um, you know, I was always playing sports, and, and you would train and you'd do things. Or even as a guitar player, the dedication, the skill it takes to learn that craft. And at times, I started to get a little convicted and think, do I have that kind of conviction? Do I have that kind of time put in, in my relationship with Christ? It's a big message, and this message is a big challenge. As representatives of Jesus Christ, are we out there representing Christ to the best of our ability? Are we doing our devotions? Are we attending Bible studies? Are we serving? Are we, are we on our knees by our beds before we go to sleep? Are we training ourselves in the Word of God? Keep it in our hearts so when, when it's there, when, it, when it's needed, it's there for us. A jump shot shooter in basketball literally is supposed to shoot three to five hundred shots a day. Just consistently. Consistency. See, are we spiritually training ourselves to show three things? Our relationship and our walk with God? Does our training show our passion for God? Discovering our purpose? and our challenges, and our victories. I was just telling somebody just a little while ago that, you know, there's a lot been going on this last nine months. It'd be easy to focus on that. But we're not supposed to. God calls us to focus on the things that are good, and pure, and lovely. Those things that are noble, things of a good report. 
We focus and meditate on those things. The, the victories, the overcoming. And I said this last week, but a relationship with Christ does not promise that we bypass trials and tribulations and challenges. But he does promise we'll overcome them. So we're going to hear a message today called the four C's of a spiritual athlete. Number one, it takes commitment. Two, it's a challenge. Three, there's some comebacks involved. And four, we have to remember the champion. Number one, we'll start with that. Commitment. We have to commit ourselves to God. We have to train spiritually. The obedience is better than sacrifice. Because without commitment, it's really hard to have accomplishment. I read you 1 Corinthians 9.24. I'm going to read it to you in the message. I use New King James most times. Once in a while I use message just for the expansion of it. 1 Corinthians 9.24.27 You've all been to the stadium and you've seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins, run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing it out for myself. This is kind of that challenge to say, hey, I'm in it, or I'm not in it at all. I'm all in, or nothing. I'm all in for Jesus. I'm giving him 100% because everything else is not good enough. To know who Christ is, to have this relationship with Jesus built every day, to know the love of Christ, how much he loves you, how much he's done for us, to just get to know him by studying his word and spending time alone, meditating, working on things, just his word and the devotions and that time in worship and prayer. You need a, a commitment. Paul is saying this is the way to run if we want to reach our full potential, to have the best relationship with God possible. One of the ways to commit to God is found in 2 Timothy 2.5. The Apostle Paul is using a metaphor from athletics when he's training up Timothy. He's telling Timothy that in order to win and, and successful ministry, he will not be crowned unless he follows God's playbook. 2 Timothy 2.5 says, And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. We must commit to the Word of God. Athletes are amazing. They, they commit to a playbook that they learn. And to be successful, they stick to it. See, they have this commitment to their bodies. They have to be in top condition spiritually. They have to know the plays. So how often are we in God's Word? How often are we learning His Word to keep it in our heart? How much more are we getting to know Jesus by how much we're learning about Him? Athletes on the team are given a playbook. And in, Ma in Proverbs, excuse me, 16.3, it says, Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. God gave you the playbook, the Holy Bible, His Word. And if you're ready for this training, if you're ready for this race, this challenge of life, we have to know His Word. Which takes me to number two. You have to recognize that we're in a fight. We have an adversary. We have an opponent. 1 Peter 5.8 Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let's see how many people remember this. In the 70s and 80s, there was a football team. I won't mention the name, but if you want to remember it, that's cool. There was this football team. And the, 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 the competition is to, to take the player out during the play. To, to stop the play. Right? Well, there was a team in the 70s and 80s that were just known for being like just ferocious, just dirty. They would, they actually had to make bets among their teammates. So when they hit somebody, they didn't try to take them out of the play. They tried to take them out of the game. 
They were trying to break legs, break collarbones. They used to pay each other if they took somebody off on a stretcher or carried them off on the field. You remember that team? A couple of guys are nodding. It, it was cruel. They didn't try to take them out of the play. They tried to take them completely out of the game. They wanted to make them ineffective. See, that's who we're fighting against. 1 Peter 5.8 in the message says, Keep a cool head. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on the faith. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal and glorious plans they are, will have you put together on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. The opponent wants to take you out. He wants to put you on the sidelines. He wants to make you ineffective Christians. How do we defeat an opponent like that? You have the playbook. We have the Word of God. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? And when we feel like the challenge is too much, when we're down, we're going to get tackled or maybe we're stunned momentarily. I, I, you know those five stage, stages of grief, right? The, the shock, denial, the anger, the, you know, the bargaining and the acceptance part. For a long time, I was kind of caught in that shock part. I, I was stunned. And in a lot of ways, I, I think we still are. But just for those of you that feel this way, just daily, you just, what? There's no way that happened. There's no way. You're just stunned. You're shocked. And for a little while, I think I was trying not to become ineffective. But, but that's what the enemy wants. See, we belong to Christ. We belong to Jesus. And the enemy knows that. But why do we feel like there's attack still? Why, why do we still feel at times... We get knocked a bit. That's because the enemy wants to take you out as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, make you ineffective, destroy your testimony, have you fall back into temptation, start bringing up the past again, start giving him the things that you already want to battle over. Enemy wants to put you on the bench. He wants to put you on the sideline. He doesn't want you out for the play or for the day. He wants you carried out on a stretcher. He wants you to sit broken, wounded, ineffective Christians who do, do no good as an ambassador of Christ. That's our opponent. The training that we need to do is so important because that's how we defeat our enemy. And if you find yourself stunned momentarily, you find yourself out of the game for a moment, the good news is, the third C, it's comeback. God's mercies are new every single day. He forgives us when we stumble and fall. When we repent and we get back up and we strive for Jesus and we just sit and bask in his love and we worship him and we love him and we build our strength back up and we get into the word and we commit and realize we have a challenge, it is ready for a comeback. See, life is going to have trials and tribulations and tough times. God knows this. He addresses it in his word. He always has a plan, a way for us to get back up and get back in the game. Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. He gives strength to the weary, increases the powers of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run. They will not grow weary. They will, not, they will, they will walk and not be faint. See, God won't take you out of the game. God's trying to get us to be active. We take ourselves out most of the time, to tell you the truth. We get down. We let the enemy knock us around a bit or life knock us around a bit or maybe we make a mistake and we figure we're not worthy. We're not good enough. We listen to people too often. We forget of God's forgiveness, His grace, His mercy, His love. We forget, as James 1 says, that we can find joy in the times of trials and tribulations. We can still count it joy. 
we can still remember that we're overcomers. Remember, we're on the winning team. I love it when I hear the people say, I read the end of the book, we win, yay. God's word, love, and power, that's our strength. One thing that inspires me is, as I, you know, everybody loves great comebacks, right? I'm going to, I've said this once before, I think it was during this time, when I kind of shared a message like this a few years ago. Um, I'll use my daughter as an example, because it was one of the best moments of, like, my life, where I was, like, just so proud of things in my family. But, um, so, Allison played high school basketball, and um, talk about comebacks and stuff. Um, they were playing for the uh, state division championship. It was great. It was at Chico State. And, um, and she was a sophomore, and she was on the bench. They were, she was supposed to be there just to kind of watch the, the varsity team play. She was on JV. And um, so, sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> but, um, so I won't look at you. So anyway, we're here. Um, so I'm sitting in the stands, and the place is packed. I got my video camera. And uh, I hope I still have that tape. I, but if it's not, I still have it up here every day, so it's cool. So um, I'm filming, I'm watching this game, and they're down by like 12 points at halftime. And of course, Alice is not playing. Her and a couple girls on the JV team, they're just sitting on the bench. And, um, and so my wife, Debbie, were up in the bleachers, and um, way high up, and I'm filming. And all of a sudden, you know, they're kind of getting kicked around a bit. And halftime, they go, they go in the locker room, and they come out, and uh, the team comes out. But Allison doesn't sit back on the bench. She goes, takes off her warm-up outfit, and she starts walking in the game. I'm like, whoa, she's starting. They're, they're putting her in. She's a point guard, and she's, she's, she's really good. And um, so they started Allison because, you know, the team before just wasn't doing that good. And the, the starting point guard was, was kind of struggling a bit. So they put Alice in the game. So the moment, I'm going to stay on this one for a while because it's a good memory. Um, so, so, play by play. I wish I had the video. But, so what happens is they put Alice in the game and right away, you know, she, she, they go in and she, she takes it out and there's this new energy. There's, there's like, she's getting rebounds and fast breaks and throwing, you know, long bomb passes. And I remember she throws it to Whitney and it's like stun the other team. And the next play, she steals and she goes down, she hits a three pointer. And, you know, throughout the game, it got really close. It was a little, you know, back and forth. It was like tied in the last minute. And then Allison, you know, with like, like just a few kind of seconds left, she, she takes the ball out on the side. She slides down to the left corner. They pass it back to her. She hits a three. It was like amazing. The crowd's going crazy. It was one of those like TV kind of moments. It was a great, great comeback. And I remember all the people cheering. And um, uh, it was exciting. And as soon as the game was over, first thing I did was at the time, this is quite a few years ago, at, at the time m my dad lived in Hawaii. So first thing I did is I called my dad and I gave him like this exciting play by play of what had just happened, you know. And um, so I, I just told my dad, Dad, it was like this great comeback, this, you know, one of those things you see on a TV movie. And I cheered really hard for my daughter, and everybody was cheering. We need to remember one really important thing about Christ. He cheers for us. He cheers for you. God just loves you so much. His desire is that not one person would perish, but have everlasting life. We have the best cheering section ever. God wants you to come back. He wants you to challenge yourself. He wants you to commit. Our strength is in Him. Our victory is in Him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Which takes me to the fourth C. We have to remember our, our champion is Jesus. It's the only name which we can be saved. The way, the truth, and the life. Hebrews 12.2 says, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion, who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy waiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. 
Jesus is already the champion. We have to remember, I'm going to close with this. We have to remember whose team that we're on. We have to remember as brothers and sisters of Christ, we're here to cheer each other on, to lift each other up. We're not to make our brothers stumble. We're supposed to be there to help pick them up. I have more friends now I've ever had before. I used to be a pretty big loner. Um, I could write people off pretty quick. Um, I have more friends now than ever. And it's not because of anything I've done. It's just because of the fact of what God's done to place people in my life that I needed at certain times. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about this before. It's not so much our words that show people who Christ is in us, but it's our actions. It's how well we love others. We are to make new teammates. We are to go out, be ambassadors of Christ, Share the gospel, show them who Jesus is, how much he loves them, and make new teammates, new disciples. Amen? So I'm going to close with this. One last sports story. One last sports story. So I was watching a basketball game, a high school basketball game, a few years ago. And um, one of the boys on the team was a Christian, uh, a good kid. I still am in contact with his dad on occasion. And during the game... Kind of towards the end of the game, when it was getting kind of serious, um, the other opposing team, um, one, of the, one of the basketball members, um, one of the players, twisted his ankle pretty bad, was on the ground. And, you know, uh, the, the trainer comes out and they attend to the kid and he's kind of withering in pain and he's really upset. And his teammates are kind of walking by. But the opposing team, this, this young boy, walks over, kneels behind, beside him and starts praying. And I was in the stands, and you could hear the murmuring and the people. Oh, wow, look at that. Wow, that's really cool. Wow, that's right. That other, that other team's from a Christian school, you know, because the other team was not known as a Christian school. Um, but it was really inspiring. It was really inspiring to see this young man training as an athlete, yet what it came down to, it wasn't the team that was on the front of his jersey that showed up that day or took precedence or was shown as an ambassador of this high school team. It, his action showed him to be an ambassador of Christ. It was Team Jesus that day.